All right, hi, my name is Paul Sargent. We're going to go through uh, the Reformation and religious warfare in the 16th century today, walk you, walk you through the basics and try and uh, get through this as quickly as we can. So when we think Reformation, we think of basically Martin Luther right here. Here he is at, uh, at the Diet of, of Worms, um, which is where he was called in front of uh, this guy. Charles V in order to recant his beliefs and, well, basically didn't, starting the, uh, the Protestant Reformation. Well, not starting it. Starting it is a tough question. There's a lot of starts here. So let's start with the prelude, all right? And, and it's this Christian or Northern humanism that's the big thing that starts it off. And, and, and the big idea behind this is, like, you take the idea of the Italians. The Italians had gone back... And, and, and they had looked at ancient texts, but they looked at texts which had to do with, like, you know, ways to live your life and how to run society and stuff like that. And Christian humanists are called that because they don't look at those pagan writings. They look at Christian writings, right? And their idea is to reform the church and then thus reform society. And, and so they, they look at these early Christian writings. They look at what people are saying. Um, they retranslate them. They start reading them again. And they focus on the power of education, that if, that if they could get education to be fairly widespread, that then um, people would have better access to this. And so you have two like main guys, Erasmus and Moore. Um, and Erasmus kind of goes through and, and, and does a few things. First of all, he sort of talks about morality and goodness. But, but as a scholar of Greek and, and Latin, his real big um, contribution is uh, a translation of the New Testament from earlier versions. Now, um, he, he kind of pushes this philosophy of Christ, which is larger than what the Middle Ages church, the Catholic church, had turned things into. Um, and so he's kind of pulling for a return to older, purer beliefs of, of Christianity and Catholicism that people held long before the Catholic Church had, had sort of worked its way through and all of this. Um, culminating his most well-known work is The Praise of Folly, which kind of ridicules a lot of what he sees around him in society um, in, in the early 16th century. Thomas More kind of follows him, writes Utopia in 1516, which is the story of a perfect society with, uh, well, no material goods, no personal possessions, and thus sort of little conflict, if no conflict in society whatsoever. Um, but through it, he kind of implies that the society of Europe has become corrupt and the beliefs of Europe have become corrupt. So there's a, there's a philosophical foundation that's, that's laid. And here's Erasmus working away. Um, he's the great thinker of the uh, of Christian humanists. Now, the church itself was not doing all that well. Uh, the wealth, the prosperity, the uh, power of the church had kind of gotten, had grown and thus created some negative things throughout the Middle Ages. Um, and there are a lot of things going on. Pluralism is one of them. People were buying church offices, and oftentimes they'd buy church offices in different areas so they could have more land and have more money and all of that. They came from rich families. They weren't necessarily religiously motivated. Um, and, and if you're the archbishop of two places that are very far away, you're not going to go to both of them, and some people wouldn't even go to either of them. Um, and, and, and they were always, the church, were uh, focused on this idea of salvation. How do you get saved? And they had come along, and relics had become very big during the Middle Ages. These are tangible, visible pieces of the Bible, um, pieces of the cross that Jesus was nailed to, um, the bones of saints, uh, you know, the hair of Mary the Virgin, you know, whatever it is. Um, those things had come along. And you start to see movements away from it so that you have groups that are starting to, to pull for sort of like a more personal relationship with God that's not so, you know, devoted to the church itself. Well, initially, these are all just calls for reform. This is not 
uh, a revolution. These are reforms. Saying we need to change some of our practices. We need to change some of our beliefs. We need to work to make our religion better than it is and more like it was. And these are all internal, all right? These are monks. These are priests that are initiating a lot of these calls for reform. Well, along comes Martin Luther, who starts off as a guy going to law school and goes in and changes his mind because of an event, and accounts of the event differ, so we're not going to get into that, but becomes an Augustinian monk. Um, He starts to teach, and as he teaches, he reads in the Bible uh, the writings of Paul and becomes uh, convinced that this, and this is like key to Martin Luther, that justification by faith is the thing, that people are saved by faith alone, uh, that they're not saved by good works, by doing the things the Catholic Church tells them to do, that faith is what saves you. And he also focuses on primacy of the Bible as the sole religious authority. Don't listen to what the church tells you. Look in the Bible. If it's not consistent, the Bible is the authority, he says. Well, These things come together when indulgences start to be sold. Now, indulgences were around during the Middle Ages, and there's a long history of them. Um, But the difference here is that this is an active sale of indulgences. Indulgences had been offered before as an option for penance, but now, uh, in order to uh, fund the building of St. Peter's uh, Basilica in Rome, which the Medici Pope hired Michelangelo to design, um, they got to raise some money. So, Pope Leo X sends a guy named Johann Tetzel, who's just a real good salesman, out to go and sell indulgences. And he sends them into Germany for political reasons that we won't get into right now. And uh, indulgences are basically like magic passports to heaven. Well, this doesn't sit well with Martin Luther, so in 1517, he nails the 95 Theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, challenging the sale of indulgences and the church's right to do so. Well, this gets really big, and the thing that's not on here is the role of the printing press, because the printing press becomes a real big part of this. How do you get all of his writings uh, uh, disseminated? Well, you, you print them. And increasingly, this guy becomes increasingly radical. And um, the more he writes, the, addressing the nobility of the German nation, the Babylonian captivity of the church, the freedom of the Christian man, boy, these are now starting to shift from being a, uh, being a tax on the practices like indulgences of the Catholic Church and now an attack on the Catholic Church itself and its primacy as the sole uh, source of salvation. So finally, he's excommunicated, and he's summoned by Charles V to the imperial diet in the town of Worms in 1521. Um, And uh, along the way, he gets married, this lady. Um, So, yeah, you can watch a very good movie. There's a lot of critics of the movie Luther, and there are certainly problems with it, but my gosh, it's a good movie, and it does make a good point. So my advice, enjoy it, watch it, have fun with it. All right. So this leads to the rise of Lutheranism. Uh, Luther writes his New Testament. He translates it into German, which is key. Germans can now read this. Um, sermons, images start being produced about this. Um, and he starts to get the support of the other upper classes because they see it as a way in the Holy Roman Empire to break away from the Habsburg control of the Holy Roman Emperor itself. And there's a lot of dissent within humanists and stuff like this within the church itself, and this appeals to them. Well, 1524, it goes a little bit too far because peasants take up arms and try and see this as a social revolt. You can go against authority, they they think he's saying, and he's like, no, absolutely, that's not what I meant at all. You can't go against authority. In fact, rulers are appointed by God, and he calls on rulers to forcibly put down and kill the rebellious peasants, and so they do. But you do start to see an organized church um, which are state-driven. The state, the, the political power, will have a say in what's being done in the religious services. So we're going to stop there with Lutheranism, and we're going to get on to some other areas of the Catholic Reformation in the next video. So stay tuned. My name's Paul Sargent, and thanks for watching.